Thanks. How's everybody doing? Everyone good? Awesome. Well, listen, so I have 30 minutes on the clock. For me, that's like a minute. It's like, I love to speak. I mean, some people here, you probably have a fear of public speaking. Who has a fear of public speaking? Be honest. Raise your hand, right? Well, I have a fear of not public speaking. I'm at my happiest when I'm on stage talking to lots of people. The bigger the crowd, the better. Oh, it's a great crowd. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm also glad that despite the COVID stuff in the world, we're all getting back out there and living our lives. So good for everybody here. So give yourself a round of applause, right? So th the speech that they asked me to give today was called, you know, um, from bearish to bullish on blockchain and Bitcoin, right? Meaning that I used to hate it, and now I love it and think it's got a huge future and going higher. But I wanna just say a couple things before I get to that subject. That is, I know there's a lot of people here who are looking to you know, get more success in your life. And I was listening to the last speaker, right? Very inspirational. And just, just so you understand, I, I really believe, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, and, and after I'm done making my case, about blockchain, I think you'll see why I feel this way, but I really believe that for people who are looking to become massively successful, that being in the blockchain space is probably one of the best routes, one of the best vehicles to get there. It's not the only vehicle, but certainly I believe that fortunes will be made and that you know when you get into a certain industry, or a certain sector, you can either get into an industry that has what we call headwinds, where you're like fighting against the tide, or it gives you tailwinds. Everything is going in your direction. You're in an expanding market, kind of, you know, the, the general wave is going in the same direction that you're swimming. And I will tell you, in my experience in life, I'd much rather be in an industry where I have tailwinds than when you have headwinds. It's like the last guy you want to be is the person you know, selling horse and buggies in 1900 when they just invented the, the automobile. And in some level, where we are right now with blockchain is very much like that. You, know, you don't really see it happen that often in human history when an entire industry is being created, and in this case, the financial industry is being recreated in a way that allows people, no matter where they are in the world, to participate in a banking system. You know, I, I think sometimes you forget here, people, most of you here, you're from the UAE, right, or the surrounding areas, right? UAE is an incredibly well-run country. It really is. I just, you know, you, you don't know how lucky you are to live here. I speak all over the world, all over. I go to the poorest countries. I've done charity work in the jungles of Africa. I've been to the height of Singapore, the top of the system, Wall Street, all over the world, London, I've been to the best and to the worst. I've been to Beijing, every place you can imagine. And I will tell you that you sometimes take it for granted that you live in a country that has like a first world banking system. One thing you have to realize is that most of the world is not like that. They don't have a stable currency. They don't have a well-functioning banking system that they can count on. I'll give you an example. My wife is from Argentina, she's Argentinian. And they have like five different prices for the dollar. There's like the, bl the blue price, the white price, the red price, the green. I mean, like, depending on who you speak to and what day of the week it is, and even what year the bill was printed, they give you different exchange rates. It's, it's absolutely insane. And countries all over the world are like that. And one of the things that blockchain offers and Bitcoin, and I want to distinguish between the two because they are either one and the same and then they're not, is that it offers countries 
that normally would not have access to a stable currency, a stable payment system, and banking, it gives them that access. So sometimes, if you really want to see the opportunity, you have to step outside your first world shoes that you're in. You're in a place where, you look at it, everything runs really, really well. You have a very stable currency. You have a, a, a well-functioning government that does what it's supposed to. That is the exception to the rule in most parts of the world. So that's the first case I want to make in terms of why am I a proponent of blockchain? Why I now believe in Bitcoin? Part of the reason is, why, is that it, it takes a bit of an understanding that the world is not the way where you're the country that you grew up in maybe, and the way you know things. It's very different other parts of the world. But let me go back a step now and just tell you my own journey with Bitcoin and blockchain. It's really, really important. And also, of course, I'm sure you all want to know about NFTs. I think I'm the largest or one of the top two or three largest celebrity holders of NFTs. I have a tremendous amount of money invested in NFTs right now, well over a million dollars and, and going up. So you probably want to know about that as well. But let me go back to the beginning. Number one, the first misconception about my views is I never was against blockchain. In, in most of the interviews, if you go online and see my interviews from back in 2017, early on, I was going on all the major news networks and I was saying, I love blockchain technology, but I hate Bitcoin. I think it's going to zero. That's what I said. I said, I hate Bitcoin. I think it's manipulated up. I think it's gonna be a disaster. It's gonna crash any day. And at the time, it was just topping around $20,000. And I was right on the money almost to the day when I made this public statement. I think it was on CNN or C I think it was CNN the first time I said it. I shortly said it thereafter on CNBC and Fox, right? All the networks, right? And I was dead on balls accurate that it was going to crash, and it crashed. And it crashed precipitously. It crashed hard. It went all the way down to below $2,000. And people got, many people who didn't understand the true nature of Bitcoin got wiped out and they sold and they exited the market. And I was exactly right. But what I was wrong about, and I'm the first one to admit this, is I thought it was going to zero. And I'll tell you why. Because there were, at the time, the loudest voices out there in the world of Bitcoin, we're all saying the same three things. In five years, it's gonna replace the US dollar. I thought that was absolute nonsense. To me, that was just complete bullshit. It was never going to happen, at least not anytime soon. But that was the first thing. The second thing is they were saying it's going to 500,000. Like it, next year, it's gonna be half a million. It's gonna be a million dollars. And I was hearing that. The problem with that was that that sounded very much to me about the worst type of scams that you would see in the penny stock world that I emerged from. And even I never did stuff like that. That was what the really bad people did, where what you would do is you would, like, when a, when a stock is 20 cents, if you want to attract unsophisticated investors, you tell them it's going to $2, they get a 10 for one, or $10. You don't have to say it's going to a million. If it's 20 cents, it can go to two. And that's a huge move. And in the early days of Bitcoin, it was $200, $300. They said it's going to 5,000, 8,000. But as Bitcoin started to rise up to 8,000, 10,000, 15,000, if you wanted new investors to come in, unsophisticated people to come in, you couldn't say it was going to 25,000 or 30,000. It wasn't enough. You had to say it was going to a million to attract that same type of ultra hot, unsophisticated money. So when I heard that, and in the back of my mind was something called sovereign risk, meaning, that I couldn't, as a person, and you still see this with people like Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett, when they say, I hate Bitcoin, it's rat poison squared, right? 
if you come from the traditional financial system, it's very, very difficult, A, to wrap your head around the fact that why would people even want to buy this stuff? It doesn't make any sense. There's nothing backing it, per se, so to speak, right? But also, why would the US government allow this to exist? Now, I know some of you are saying because they can't stop it. That is not true. If they really wanted to stop it back in the day, and even now, they, they actually they couldn't shut it down, but they could certainly make it so onerous for a US citizen to own this stuff that it could make it de facto impossible to really have it. They could tax it to death. They could regulate it to death. They could make it so uncomfortable for US citizens to own it that it would be a de facto, it would be a bar for the United States. And we saw something similar somewhat happen in China. So back in 2016, this was a few years after Switzerland had just given up all of its investors that had one secret account today because the US had put so much pressure on Switzerland because this, and I went, to, listen, you know I went to jail not for stocks. I went to jail for money laundering for smuggling money to Switzerland. You know, remember the movie? All the money, that's what I went to jail for. So I'm saying to myself, how on earth, why on earth would the United States of America allow something like this to take hold when they spent the last 20 years putting pressure on Switzerland and they finally got it to the point now where you can't even open up an account in Switzerland if you're a US citizen. They finally sort of won the war and what, they're just gonna back off and allow Bitcoin to take over? It, it, so, you can, so from my perspective, like, it's, not, it's impossible. Now in truth, to this day, I still don't understand why, but they didn't do anything. And it's too late, and I, I really believe they're not going to. At this point, I believe, and I, I very strongly believe, that the chances of the US becoming a negative factor in Bitcoin are close, they're not zero, but they're close to zero. Do I think they're going to try to regulate blockchain and crypto? Yes, and I think that's a great thing. And for anyone that really knows the financial markets well, what you can do is look back in history every time the governments of the world come in. I'm gonna get up the stage if that's okay. So I like to be close to everybody here so I can see your beautiful faces, right? So every time the government regulates something, an asset, it doesn't go down in value. It goes up massively in value. Case in point, when I was first getting down to Wall Street in the late 80s, it was junk bonds. And when junk bonds finally became regular, everyone's like, oh, that's it. It's over, the party's over. The government's regulating junk bonds. Sell your junk. Guess what happened? The market went up a hundredfold. A hundredfold. Why? Because once the regulations are in place, institutional money will pour into an asset class. Right now, the amount of institutional money, yeah, they've started to adopt, but it's nothing. When institutional money really starts to pour into Bitcoin, and I believe they will, because they're going to have to, once regulations are in place, they're going to have to, they almost have a fiduciary responsibility to at least have some small portion in Bitcoin. And that small portion shouldn't be enough to move the market dramatically higher because the single greatest case for the appreciation of Bitcoin, which in my mind is not currency, and I think the sooner you realize that it's not currency, it's not designed to be currency, it doesn't function like a currency, it's property, it's an asset. And as soon as that road is paved and the rules and laws are in place, I believe, and again, don't buy because I'm saying it, do research because I'm saying it. You understand? I'm not telling you to buy it or sell it. I'm telling you to look closely at it. I'm telling you why I think you should. Because the, the strongest case, and it's almost an undeniable mathematical case, 
that based on adoption and based on institutions coming into Bitcoin, let me ask all of you a question. What do you think is going to happen to the price of Bitcoin when the regulatory landscape is fully formed and all the institutions around the world start putting some amount, where do you think the price of Bitcoin is going? It's probably going higher. On Wall Street, there's an old saying, institutional money is usually smart money, and even when it's not, it's enough to fuel the market anyway. None of these things existed in 2017 when I said I thought Bitcoin was going to zero, and I thought it was going to zero because of all the earmarkings of a penny stock scam, from my perspective from what the people yelling it's going to a million, from people saying it's going to replace the dollar, an outrageous claim. That's not possible. It doesn't make, it's not meant to replace the dollar. Now, are there other things, by the way, that will replace the dollar or significantly augment the dollar? Yes, there are something called stable coins. Stable coins are actually bullish for the US dollar because what are stable coins all pegged to? The dollar. The stable coins are all pegged to the dollar. So the reliance of this, of, of the blockchain market, the blockchain infrastructure using stable coins is a bullish case for the US dollar. And that shouldn't scare the US government. But again, none of this really existed back when I was very negative. And I thought for sure that they would come in the US and just slash and burn the whole thing down. And that would be that. But something very funny happened. Bitcoin bottomed out at a market cap of $3 billion. $3 billion. And not only did it not go away, but in this next leg up, a very different type of person started looking at Bitcoin. Large institutional players started di dipping their toes in the water. Very smart people started getting involved. And with the advent of Ethereum, which represented the more functional, the smart contract side of the blockchain, suddenly this whole system of decentralized finance and all of these things began springing up in its own ecosystem, the punctuation mark of which is FTs. So if you want to know why I'm bullish now, that's why. That's why I'm bullish now, because I believe, and again, this is just my belief, I believe that we're at the point right now where sovereign risk is minimal. And we've even seen the resiliency of Bitcoin and blockchain itself with China. The hash rate, the amount of transactions happening is already returned basically to where it was before China shut down all the mining. The price, while it's gone lower, I believe it's good that this healthy trading range which has developed is good for Bitcoin. The consolidation that happens when something stays around the same spot. Something that fluctuates wildly is not a good asset. The less volatile, the better. I wouldn't look at Bitcoin as a get-rich-quick scheme. I don't think it's meant to be that. If you want to have an example here, it would be like Bitcoin almost represents like the S&P of the blockchain world. And Ethereum right behind it. And then you have all these other altcoins they're coin, called, and I want to talk about those real quickly, which I divide into three categories. One are the really solid altcoins. Thing, these are protocols, they're called, that have strong use cases. They do things. They allow certain things to happen, whether it's financial traction, uh, transactions, the movement of certain assets, the transference and movement of rights around the world. Commerce, they serve purposes. They're designed by really smart people who are envisioning a new world, a world that is not so heavily controlled by centralized institutions that can debase their currencies at a whim when they feel like it, which is one of the arguments against the US dollar. But the US dollar, I think, is like the best of the best, like the best bad options, the US dollar, basically, right? So I wouldn't even go down that, that rabbit hole. But the point is, is that there are these group of 
altcoins out there. I don't want to mention any one of them in particular, but they have tremendous short-term and long-term prospects. And many of them, many of the best, best ones with the best use cases and the smartest people are going to go to zero. Because that's just the way of the world. That's how it goes when you're speculating and you're reinventing a financial system. But some are going to be fabulously successful with just the returns you couldn't even imagine. Then you have what are called the joke coins. Things like Dogecoin, Shiba Inu. Right? I don't hate, people think I hate those. I don't hate those at all. They're just kind of jokes. I, would, I, don't, I never buy them because it's pure speculation. It's the equivalent of who's the most popular girl in school this week. If you can figure out who the most popular girl in school is next week, you should buy those coins. Each one being who's a girl, who's most popular, because they just go up and down based on what either Elon Musk said or a bunch of influencers said. I don't want any part of that because they just don't make, it doesn't make sense, but it's fun. And if you want to speculate, maybe may, win, maybe lose, you can do that. You can go to the track and bet on a horse. Kind of the same thing to me, but I don't hate them. They're not evil. The people that invented them were not evil. But then you do have what are called shit coins which is a very large group of coins that were designed by people with only one purpose in mind, to separate all of you from your money. And the sooner the governments of the world regulate those coins out of business and the people that made lots of money get what's coming to them, the better. Because they give Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the legitimate altcoins a bad fucking name and it drives me crazy, excuse my language, but it drives me crazy. It causes people to lose money and it gives the legit players, and a lot of these legit players, they're close friends of mine. I've really gotten myself entrenched in the world of decentralized finance and NFTs, and I gotta tell you, there's some really brilliant people working on this stuff right now, and they're playing a very long game, and that long game is based on a word you probably heard called the metaverse. What is the metaverse? What is the matrix, right? What is the metaverse, right? So the, the best way for me to explain the metaverse is, is two ways. Number one is from the creator perspective. The metaverse is something that creators like to call Web3, meaning it's a way for individuals to take back power on the internet. The way Web2 was formed was the things like platforms, Google, Facebook, really Facebook, you know, LinkedIn, these big platforms, Instagram, TikTok, where centralized companies control the flow of information and get fabulously rich while the people that create the information and create the content make the crumbs very little. Web3 is more about a decentralized internet where these large centralized platforms play a dramatically reduced role and the individual creators themselves can make what they deserve to make because they're the ones creating the engagement, because they're creating the content, and so forth. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is more of this 3D immersive experience where imagine if we all were wearing these glasses, but they weren't weird glasses like Google tried a bunch of years ago, but they look no different than the glasses this man is wearing right here. He's got a nice pair of glasses on, but imagine if those look like normal glasses, but he was seeing an enhanced view of the world around him. Anything that he would want to see, a much richer experience of moving through the world. And I think that's what the metaverse will ultimately be, and we'll be able to experience a richer world. We'll all feel more connected without always being in front of each other. I hope. That never takes the place of us being in front of each other, because I'll tell you, after two years of giving virtual speeches, I want to kill myself, all right? Because I'll love this to be in front of you all. There is no replacement for that. But still, a better, more immersive experience, the metaverse is about that. And if you imagine the metaverse itself is like the highways and byways, it's like almost like laying down the railroad track back in the 1800s, right, when all the railroad track was being laid, no one really knew what was going to spring up in all these towns that would come at the railroad stops. But we knew something would. 
and people built industries and opened up companies all throughout the world because of the track. In fact, if anyone here is from any Australians here, right? So one of the big things about Australia, it's really weird to me from the United States, and I spent a lot of time in Australia, I love it, but you have a concentration of people on the East Coast and a concentration along the West Coast and basically nothing in between for the most part. Why? Because they never had a centralized rail system that actually created spokes. And it was like you had to change track because they didn't fit. The West couldn't talk to the East, so nothing sprung up in the middle. You have a lot of what they call the outback there, right? And it's pretty, you know, wild there, some of the stuff that's been there. It's cool. But the point is, is imagine like the metaverse being the railroad track. What's going to spring up there? I don't know everything that will, but they'll be designated as real or not by being NFTs. NFTs are the digital authentication of anything. It could, right now we hear it with artwork, mostly, and sometimes you scratch your head, you say, why is that ugly piece of shit artwork selling for 500 grand? I bought a CryptoPunk. I paid 450,000 US dollars in Ethereum. It's on my Twitter profile. I showed my wife the day after. I said, honey, I just bought this CryptoPunk. What do you think I paid for it? She looks at me, she goes, $12. I said, well, I'll tell you two things, honey. A, you can kiss your career as an NFT appraiser goodbye. <laughs> This is number one. And number two, you're wrong, all right? She almost killed me when she found out, although someone offered me a million dollars a week later. Why? Well, partly because when I buy something, I guess it gives it more cachet because I'm a brand, but also scarcity and money is pouring into NFTs because Facebook made that big announcement about Meta. Well, you know, I'm not always a big Zuckerberg fan, but he's not stupid. He's not stupid. I think we'd all agree on that. So what role Facebook slash Meta ultimately plays, none of us know. But NFTs are not going anywhere. And I can promise you one thing. The use cases are going to go far beyond what you see. With artwork, the communities that spring up around artwork, the utility that comes with NFTs. So if I were you, I'd pay very, very close attention to this space as well question you could ask, which ones do I buy? I'm not going to tell you what to buy, but what I will tell you is start small. Start small because you're probably going to have a little bit of education money to spend here before you get it right. But start off small with money you can afford to lose, but start. Get your wallet open. Start getting into the space. I would strongly urge you to just learn about the space, get comfortable operating within the space, and very quickly, very soon after that, your eyes will be opened for all the opportunities that are coming very quickly. The people I know that are really engaged in this stuff at the highest level, they're talking about months and a year or two, not 10 years out. So it's not technology that's 10 years, they're talking now, next six months. I'm hearing really, really bold predictions from people that I trust. So my journey from being a bear to a bull was really more about Bitcoin. And if you want to know where I think Bitcoin's going right now, I think it's going higher. But I think it might go lower first too, and I, don't, I hope it goes lower. Like, for me, I, 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 pray, I wake up in the morning and pray that Bitcoin goes to 10,000. You know why? Because I'm going to take almost every dollar I have and buy it. Because I missed out the last time. Okay? I missed out. I don't mean I bet every dollar, but also I make a lot of money each week so I can afford to replace my losses. But figuratively speaking, I would urge you to really start looking at this stuff and within your own limits... Starting very small, it's time to accept that this is going to be the 21st century. It's going to be on the blockchain. Sooner rather than later, all these big institutions are going to embrace it fully once more laws are passed, and that's going to create the most bullish use case of all, which means massive adoption across the world, in countries that were formerly unbanked or underbanked or did not have stable currencies, you're going to see massive benefits to them. And for all of you in first world countries, most of you, virtually all of you, 
You can use this as a great way to diversify your portfolios, protect your assets against inflation, and generally secure the lives of yourselves, your family, your community, people that you love. I believe it's an amazing asset for that. And if you look at it that way, I think you'll do really, really well. And with that, believe it or not, I'm already out of time. So the good news is that we're not over now. It comes a 30-minute Q&A. But thanks for listening to my 30 minutes here. I love you all. You guys are phenomenal. Hey, and we're going to do questions in a moment. Not yet, guys. Questions not yet. Uh, Jordan, Michael Saylor, what do you think? I like Michael Saylor. I mean, I, th I, think, he's, I think he's very smart. I think he's, I, I give him a list of balls the he's size got huge of balls Michael. right yeah he's got big balls this guy right so to speak um he makes a good case um the only thing i'd say is that you know he, at this point he has to make a good case because he's got so much in he's got so much invested in it what he says makes sense um just again but always remember that you know when someone is speaking yes what's their motivation what do they have to gain? But I like Michael, so I think he's very smart. He's clearly you know, one of the first major institutional adopters, and I think history will prove him right, maybe not quite as right as he thinks, but I think history will prove him very but right. But is he somebody that we should pay attention to? Because I, I think for sure you should pay attention to him, but also remember, you know, I, I wouldn't say he's a Bitcoin maximalist, but he certainly is very, I mean, I don't think he proposes everything else, but he's, that's the one thing is so Bitcoin-centric, and I believe that it's dangerous to just bet on any one thing in this space. Okay, and then let's talk about the old ICO market. You yeah. were around for that. Yes. Okay, so ICO sounded like a great idea. Where did it collapse? Well, by the way, do you want to sit down or sure, do you want to stand sure, yeah, up? Which yeah, one sure, do you want to do? Down, sit down, yeah. Want to sit down? So, so one thing I would say That's about, about ICOs good. is that, you know, the wheels of justice grind slowly. You know, ICO is really, uh, most of them are IPOs, and I still think many of them are going to get the hammer, the regulatory hammer, put down on them by the SEC. Not all of them, and I'm not saying they're gonna drive them out of business, but you know, I think the problem was when you have no regulation like that, it gets very difficult to, to find the good ones from the bad ones. There were so many pump and dumps and rug pulls, but there was all some good ones in there as well, so that's the problem. And then let's get a little away from Bitcoin and blockchain, SPACs. Okay, so, so SPAC, ironically, I was doing SPACs in 1988. Been around a while. Yeah, and the guy who was my mentor invented SPACs. They called them blind pools back then. And there was SPACs, and I think SPACs are okay, but again, you know, anything could be okay when it's being used as a tool by the right people. But what ends up happening is Wall Street and its greediness will see an opportunity to make a lot of money, and they'll suddenly will just raise a ton of money for SPACs because they make lots of fees on the SPACs. And then suddenly you have too many SPACs chasing too few deals that really belong to merge into SPACs. And for those of you who don't know what a SPAC is, a SPAC is a special purpose acquisition corp. It means that it's a pool of money that's put together that's gonna buy a company. There's no active business, but it's a bunch of money that is gonna to target to buy a business. It could be in an industry or no, in, in any industry they want. But the point is, is that a few SPACs would be great, but a lot of SPACs leads to where there's not enough good companies and they start taking subpar companies and the quality goes down and the rest is history. Turn your microphone's rubbing on your collar. If you could lift that up just a little more okay. there. So we got ICOs, Wayside. SPACs kind of feeling like ICOs in some ways, right? Kind well, of I think there's like always it. a place for SPACs, but there needs to be a, a fewer amount of them to make sure there's enough deals to merge in. And you mentioned uh, stable coins pegged to the dollar. That digital yuan's looking really interesting and kind of scary at the same time, doesn't it? I, I don't think that the digital yuan is going to really, um, this is just a guess, and I, I love China. I have nothing against China. I speak in China. I think they've done an amazing job of, 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 of elevating people out of poverty. It's incredible, the China story. I, I think the world is somewhat uncomfortable to adopt a digital yuan as a reserve currency or token because of the power it gives the government. I don't think they'd want a centralized digital dollar, by the way, as well. I think that people like that. I don't, I don't think that, I don't think the adoption's been that high of the yuan compared to yeah, stable but the coins. one belt, one road, and all the countries that China's kind of mandated it, they're going to push it. So all of a sudden, we're going to see some countries that you would never think say we got to use it, like Sri Lanka or something like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that's going to happen. I, believe, I don't believe that's going to happen. I think they'll be pushed back 
um, against the digital one. I think that it will serve some purpose, but I don't think it's gonna become a dominant um, way of doing business. Do you remember about a year and a half ago, Facebook was trying to do their own token? Yes. And that just kind of panned out? Well, it didn't pan out. They, they, they got a, a call from the SEC saying, stop. Yeah, that's what happened, right? Right, yeah. So the government has some, U.S. government has some serious power. Yeah, and I, I, I remember this. So, you know, what, what typically separates what Bitcoin from other things, it's surely decentralized. It actually is decentralized. No one runs Bitcoin, right? It's made up of all these nodes around the world. And there's a test that the U.S. uses called the Howey test and it says, is something a security or not? And if it's central authority, it becomes a security. Well, obviously Facebook running its own ecosystem that's gonna eventually cross over and be traded very much sounds like a security and that's what stopped it. But they could do their own token. My guess is, is that there's gonna be massive regulatory pushback against Facebook having a token that's not severely limited to utility within Facebook. I don't mm. think it would ever be allowed to be, just my guess, but who knows what the it. future brings. But if we do look at inflation happening in the States, because it's going up, what are you doing to prevent your money from eroding with inflation situation? Well, I, I, I am a big investor in Bitcoin. I'm a big investor in a lot of altcoins and Ethereum. Um, I do a lot of VC, venture capital. Um, I keep enough money around in dollars just to be safe, but- You do have a lot of cash sitting around. I, well, of course I do, because I have to, because I have a lot of expenses. How about, how about gold? Are you doing any precious no, metals? No, I don't like, I don't like, I think that if you want to look at, if you, the simplest way to look at Bitcoin is gold 2.0, and, and I, would, I think there's no reason to own gold. I think Bitcoin is, is far better than gold for a lot of reasons. So if you look at your portfolio, what would you break it up into? How much in cash reserve? How much in digital? How much in traditional stocks? What do you think it would be? Just remember this, the way I do it would not work for most of you because I have a very large income. So my income is, is, is very large, so I can replace my cash. But so percentage I only hold 25% in cash. You hold 25%? 20, 20, 25%. And then what would be the breakdown on the other side? Probably from the 60% crypto, 10% real estate, 10% VC deals. Uh, no S and P. I mean, small amounts in the S and P. Just you're not playing the market as much as I you actually believe. I was including the S and P in my cash. In my, <laughs> that's my part of my cash. <laughs> that's your cash. That's cash to me is the S and P. Wow. And have you been pretty happy with the performance? I mean, market's a little over. I'm writing, right now. I'm writing a book right now, and the, the thesis basically is that oh, you look back at the last 50 years, the S and P is the safest place to put Absolutely. your money. Absolutely. It just is. You can't beat the S and P to reinvest dividends in a Vanguard, no load fund. So. Um, but for me, I make so much money on my money doing trading because I'm wired in. So I'm saying don't always look at what I do for you because I have access to information, not inside information, just deals, early stage deals, C deals and, and offerings. They come to you, right. That, that, that most people might not have. Um, but if you look back mathematically, the S&P is the best way. The problem is, is that it's so boring and, and most people don't have the emotional discipline to just buy the S&P. So you need to have to, you need to learn how to play the other games as well, the higher risk games, it's a bit of trading. So you want to have a more diversified approach. Can I get personal? Sure. Not too personal. But of course you can. You go to jail for, is it considered money? It's not money laundering. Is that what yeah, it would well, be called? I smuggled money to Switzerland, so it's money laundering. It is money laundering, right? I wasn't like putting it in a washing machine or anything. You're, but, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're sitting in jail. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that I let everybody down around me who loves me and counts on me the most. And I hurt many people that I didn't even know. And you know, they were rich people, but still it was wrong. I was, you know, only selling to rich people, didn't make it right. But I, you know, I felt like, you know, when you're in jail, you feel like you've lost the game of life. That's how you feel. Mm. Now, it's not my nature to allow myself to feel that way, but it's very difficult when you're in jail, surrounded by all the people who have basically lost their freedom, lost all their money, most of them have lost their families. It's a tough place to be. Um, I was very fortunate in the sense that when I went to jail, my bunkmate was Tommy Chong from Cheech and Chong. No way. Yeah, he was my bunkmate, yeah. A famous actor and writer, and he was writing a book, and he, after a few nights, you know, me telling him stories, he's like, you have to write a book. I'm like, really? I didn't think my life was that crazy, you know, it was my life. And I started writing a book, 
And that became my redemption for me and my mind. And whenever I needed to understand why, you know, why am I doing this? Why do I want to come back from failure? All I had to do was close my eyes and see the faces of my two children. Mm. That was it. I, you know, my children meant everything, everything to me and I'd let them down and I felt like I just owed it to them to show them that their dad could come back and who their father really was. And that was what kept me going in jail was, was the faces of my children and writing this book. And I, I could have never imagined the book would have turned out that what it became, you know, movies and everything. So, but that's how it started. How long were you incarcerated? 22 months. 22 months. That's interesting. One of my friends is a guy named Dennis Levine. If you know Drexel, yeah, yeah Dennis of course is. I know. He went to jail right before me, yeah. 22 months also. Yeah. Same amount of time. He's one of my mentors. Yeah. So you're sitting in jail, you get out, and then you go, I'm going to do this. I mean, you've been pondering it. What was it you're going to do? Was it just absorb life for a while, or were you ready to go again? No, so, so what happened was in jail, I started writing but I threw out all the pages. I didn't think my writing was good enough. So I, when I exited jail, I didn't have a book. So I always knew I'd make money. I was a great salesperson. I knew the rules of business and entrepreneurship. I knew I'd start a good a business again, right? But I said, you know what? Let me try to write. Let me just try to write this book. I felt like I had a story to tell. And that's what I did. I started writing. And by the time I got to the and page, I was like, wow, this looks pretty good. And I sent it to a, an agent and they like just went crazy over it. And, and just like that, it was bought by the largest publisher in the world, Random House, and, and just came, and that was it. And I was on this course and I finished the book after about a year. Uh, they give me a pretty big advance. I had a, a $500,000 advance, which was big for me back then. And, um, and that book just served as the basis for this comeback, which is uh, still in progress. Well, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. So who contacted you from a studio saying, we want to take the book and turn it into a movie? So what happened was very early on, as I was writing the book, my agent, had, my book agent had slipped the manuscript to a very powerful producer, a woman in Hollywood named Alexandra Milshan. And she saw this early pages and she's like, oh my God, this is amazing. Oh my, I, as soon as you're done, I want to get this made into a movie. And she actually said, this is perfect for Leo and Marty. Really? She actually said that, yeah. You were already subcasted basically. I couldn't believe it, right? Why? So then, um, so when I finished the first, as soon as I was finished with the book, it was edited now. It wasn't a book yet, but it was edited in manuscript. She slipped it to Marty, Squ so to Leo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, Mark Wahlberg, and George Clooney. And the bidding war started between, it was between Brad Pitt and Leo because at the time, Mark Warburg wasn't quite as big a star. He became one later on. And George Clooney was too old, I thought. Um, and it came down to Leo and Brad and both sides said, whatever he pays, I'll pay you 10% more. And the bidding went up and up and up over this long weekend. And finally, Leo calls me, he's like, guess who I got to direct? Marty Scorsese wants to direct. And what was I going to say to that? Wait, so Leo was instrumental in getting Scorsese? Yeah, it was Leo. That's incredible. Yeah. So now you're sitting here watching this being developed. Were you, did you go on set? Yeah, well, I worked with Leo for a year straight. Like, we were together every day, spending a ton of time together. So we, in, I, we rewrote every, it was, the screenplay was written by Terrence Winter. Brilliant writer, but I polished every word with Leo. It, it was an amazing experience. Movie comes out. It's a huge hit. So, so the movie, it's interesting. So the movie was a huge hit, but what happened was, so it had this huge success in the box office and then it, you know, whatever, it went on video and that was that. It kind of died for a few months. And then about six months after it's on video, my daughter, who was in college at the time, she's like, dad, I'm, I'm at the University of Michigan football stadium, there's 50,000 people and they're all pointing at me and they're singing a song, Jordan Belfort. I'm like, what? She's like, there's a song they made about the movie about you called Jordan Belfort. And I'm like, no. And she holds up the phone and it's this crazy rap song and something happened. The movie became the ultimate cult sensation. That Halloween, people started dressing up as me and my wife for Halloween. And then it just, and at the end of the year, it came out the most illegally downloaded movies of all time. Number one, 
Wolf of Wall Street. And that's, and it just took on a life of its own and became a cult, right? And, the, and I'll tell you why. I think part, I owe part of that to, to the UAE in this part of the world because, you know, the censorship in this part of the world is pretty severe with some of the stuff I did, probably rightfully so, right? And so if you watch the original version in theaters here, it was like 45 minutes long. It was like, hello, goodbye, it was over, right? Really? They cut that much out? <laughs> they cut a lot of it out. So they know nothing about Margot Robbie. So, right, so a lot of that was out, right? <laughs> so people had to go and watch it online. <laughs> And it just had this massive, uh, and it just became something, and then it started getting memed, and it, and it just became a part of pop culture. And I think it's the most memed movie of all time by far, and um, it's just, um, it's been, and since then it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and, and now it hasn't been announced yet, but there's a, a, a TV docuseries coming out, which I'm starring in. Wow. I'll be on Netflix, um, and that's coming out next year. It's gonna be massive on Netflix, so yeah, it's just taken on this incredible, uh, you know, just place in, in pop culture, which is great. What social platform do you like the most? TikTok. I, I'll tell you why, I, I think that, you know, Facebook had its day, and I think it still serves a purpose, I don't like it that much. Instagram became too much posing, like, oh, the perfect pose, the perfect pose, you know? Like, so it wasn't real life. TikTok is like everybody, it's the best and worst of humanity all wrapped up into one. So I find it more enjoyable, and also the algorithms are such right now, you can grow very, very fast on TikTok, and it is really painfully difficult to grow your following on Instagram right, right now. And, uh, but Instagram has some decent monetization tools. T TikTok really doesn't have them yet. I, I don't use don't social care. media to make money per se. Social media for me is about brand building, and then I make my money in other ways. Got it. Spider-Man or Matrix, which one are you gonna see? I'm gonna see both. I'm, I'm, really, I'm a big Marvel fan, but I'm really looking forward to the Matrix. I hope that it's not like the second or third parts. I hope it's like the original Matrix. Yeah, it was pretty good. Which I just watched again on the plane, by the way, over here. Anybody want to even ask this guy a question? Probably not, right? <laughs> so let's do this. We got a couple of microphones around. You just raise your hand and do me a favor. I'm going to have you stand up, say your name, and say where you're from. Whoever has the microphone. Do you have a microphone? Whoever has a microphone, stand up first. Here you go. What's your name? Where are you from? And what's your question? Hello. My name is Sergi. I'm from Ukraine. I'm based in Dubai. So I have a question. Can you give me your email? Because I have a unique <laughs> NFT for you. It's tank, huge one, unique just for you with your branding and with your naming. Yeah, of course. Send, your, send it to support at jordanbelfort.com. Oh, that's so personal. Or you can DM me on Instagram, by there the way. There you go. Or just DM me. Do you answer those? What? Do you actually, you don't answer your Instagram. No, but I have a team of people that looks through every single email and every single... Um, yeah, but he's special. He I just, know. How does he get to you? Nothing against you, my friend, but you know, if I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to answer everybody's email, so that's the best way to sift through. There you go. What's your name, where are you from, and what's your question? Hi, my name is Maria. I'm also coming from Ukraine, but also based in Dubai. So my request, because I'm organizing blockchain conferences in Dubai, so I would ask for an email to invite you to one of our blockchain conferences in the future. This is one thing. And wait, wait, first, he's not cheap. Wait, so I can imagine, but uh, at this, okay. we can negotiate, so, so I believe the person, so. The person that handles <laughs> that for me, yes. his name is Matt, so you email Matt. him at Matt, M-A-T-T, at jordanbelfort.com, and he will answer you within a few minutes. There you okay, go. Okay, thank you. Matt at M -A -T -T Jordan. M-A-T-T at jordanbelfort.com. Right down. Okay, Matt's thank you. Matt's going to say, why'd you do that? I got 8 billion emails <laughs> besides ours. <laughs> well, still, like, not everybody's watching this, so maybe it will be, like, five, but we'll see. Uh, and another question, because you talked to my... Uh, a lot today about NFTs, about uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and etc. But also, I, and you mentioned, it's a really valid point, if USA wanted to make the similar thing what China did recently, they would did it, they would do it. But at the same time, what do you still think with the rise of CBDCs, what will be the next step mm -hmm. in the US and in the world? I, I didn't say, what? Central, uh, central bank banks. digital currencies. Yeah. 
So, also, what's your view on this? Because I, would I, you save in the like in the future? Would you like to save a lot of your money in central bank digital currencies, as well? So I, I don't I don't think that. Remember, I don't look at Bitcoin at all as currencies. I looked at them as property. As so I don't believe that any of that stuff has any impact on Bitcoin. I mean, I don't think people are going to use their Bitcoin or their altcoins to go pay for a, a pizza or a cup of coffee or Not anymore. things like that. You know, but so I, I don't think it's really. They, I don't think they compete with each other. I think they more would compete with stable coins. Um, but it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't bother me particularly a digital dollar, which I think is inevitable. Um, I, I don't think affects, if anything, it, it serves the Bitcoin community because it just would create more utility to go on ramps, less fees on and off. Now that being said, um, the dollar's already digital. The way it is, and we have, you know, you, you think about it, like, you know, it's all done online through settlements. It's not, it's, it's block, it's not blockchain associated is the difference. It's a privatized ledger that only they see, so they can debase it is the bigger issue. So I don't really look at that as a big threat. Let's go to one more Thank question you. over here. Go ahead. Stand up. What is your name? What's your question? Last question. You don't have a microphone. Need a microphone over here, please. Here you go. Uh, hi. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my question would be about... Uh, what is your name? Where are you from? What's I'm your Patrick question? from the Philippines. So um, I've been sharing uh, blockchain with my family. So my question would be, how would you explain or um, encourage or motivate your, the quote-unquote boomer <laughs> generation what is it? about blockchain? You want, wait, a, a boomer on blockchain? Yeah. A but they, they've been interested. They made a f joke of me yeah. earlier. They said, okay, boomer, <laughs> yeah, because think... they look at our generation being older and the way we look at things compared right. to a younger generation. Yeah. So do you ever somehow look at the younger generation, look through their eyes on what they're seeing, regardless, that may be different than what you're seeing? Of, of course. I mean, so that's a really valid point, by the way, but that's what my, that's why I always had children. <laughs> <laughs> they helped I was lucky enough things. to have children who are now in their 20s, right? And, and, and they both... One of them did, they both, now one works for me right now, but um, a, a lot of what I originally, you know, of what I saw happening with my kids playing video games and chasing after virtual goods like virtual lives and virtual bags of gold, it really opened up my eyes to this idea that people would pay for virtual assets that didn't exist in the real world. But also, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've always been, uh, I wouldn't say good at, but one of the things I've been a pro proponent of is, is walking in other people's shoes. And I think it's why I'm so good at selling is because I'm very, very quick to put myself in the other person's place and try to look at the world through their eyes in the case of sales to help meet their needs and resolve their pain points. Or in this case, it would be more to see how they view the world in terms of money and the future of, you know, of finance and so forth. So it's been very helpful to me. Yeah, but the irony is you go back to that selling concept. It's hard to sell a digital token. It's hard for someone to grasp it. It really is. If, if you had to sell it back, like the pen joke, obviously, in the movie, <laughs> if someone said, all right, hey, sell me sell this Bitcoin, <laughs> that would have been kind of a, a tricky thing to do. Right? Yeah, exactly. I think I made a pretty good case for Bitcoin today, but, but I, I think that, again, you know, there, there's two things. Remember that when you're selling anything, it's not just the asset that you're selling or the product, you're also selling yourself you're selling the company or community that stands behind the product. So I just think sometimes when people are selling a digital asset, they don't rely enough on the use cases of the right. utility. They just talk about it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. And I think people want to know why as well. Can you pull your mask down so we can hear you properly? There I you love go. your empathy. I love, I love how you would relate to people naturally. And I think that would help um, my family and my friends. On, helping them learn more about blockchain. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Another question from over here. Go ahead, what is your name and where are you from and what's your question? Uh, hello, Jordan, my name is Anna Tutova. I'm CEO of crypto media group Coins Telegram and I'm from Ukraine and as well speak at this conference. This must and, be the Ukrainian uh, section right here. This yeah. Is the <laughs> well, you know, I read today Ukraine is one of the top three, four countries in the world for adoption of crypto. Yeah, I guess even maybe top one or top two. <laughs> 
so our team was uh, recently in El Salvador, the first uh, country in the world which adopted Bitcoin as legal tender, and we met there with a lot of government officials. And I would like to know your opinion about the future of the implementation of Bitcoin in this country, and whether there is a future of uh, adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender by uh, other countries too. Um, I, I, from what I, I was intimately involved with, with what was going on in El Salvador through a very close friend of mine who was the advisor to the government down there. Um, and uh, he owns a firm in Texas and they were really involved with creating the wallet and, and helping with implementation. And from what I've heard that the, the, the actual usage there is not very high at all. That's what I've heard from people who really know. Now, again, I have not been down there, so I can't say firsthand, so I always discount what I hear through third parties. But from what I've heard, um, a lot of it is more about public image and things like that, and the actual impact on the ground has been ra rather minimal. But that's just what I've heard from people, but they're very reliable sources. What do I think about Bitcoin as legal tender? I don't personally believe that Bitcoin is well designed as legal tender. I, I think it is much better off as property. Um, I think that there are other things that make more sense as legal tender, like certain types of stable coins or whatnot. But I just don't think that the Bitcoin itself because of transaction fees, and they say, oh, about the Lightning Network, well, that's very unstable still. So I just don't think that um, Bitcoin really should be legal tender, at least in the form it's in now and the way things are today. Thank you so much. You. Another question? Up Hi, guys. Can microphone. I ask you? Okay. Let Sorry. me guess, you're from the Ukraine. Yes, of course. My name is Igor. <laughs> I'm from Ukraine, too. So I want to ask you, all the people ask you about Bitcoin, about future, about everything, about how you can invest. But I want to ask you, what for you important things in your life for you? What's that, what? What's your important things in your life for you? Sinks, as why in I mean, like, some things, yeah. Important things. things. What are important yeah. things in your yeah. life? Ah, to me? Children? To you, of course, of course. My children, number one, number one for sure. My family, my lifestyle. Um, well, certainly, number one is my is my. Uh, I'm, for me, it's interesting. Like, I've always put my family before myself, um, and I'm not sure if that's a smart thing to do. You know, there's an old saying. You know, when you go to the plane, and they give you that that security warning in the beginning, say, if those masks should fall out from the plane, put your own mask on first. And then put your mask of your child on because without oxygen, you can't breathe and you can't help anybody. So on some level, you have to help yourself as well. But I think that for me, very often, helping my family and myself have, have not been mutually exclusive. They both occur at the same time. That's one thing. A second thing for me, which is so important, is giving value to people. I love, I get high on helping other people succeed. I do. And I get rich at it too, so it's really great. <laughs> Like, I have this great thing that what I do for a living helps other people make money, and, and but my high comes from helping other people. There's a girl here today named Isabel, and I don't know if she's spoken yet, but she, I, did. she did speak, and you know, Isabel said to me, you changed my life, it's because of you I'm here today. And like, when I hear that, that's like, how can you quantify what that's worth? I mean, you know, no money in the world. Now, of course, that doesn't mean I don't need money too, because I love freaking money. I love private jets and yachts, and I, and I love spending money, I, and I spend a lot of it, I can promise you, okay? But the good feelings I get in life come from helping other people achieve success. Thank you. Let's go over another question. One, maybe uh, I'm not from Ukraine, so I'm You're from not, Moscow. It, yeah. <laughs> I'm from Moscow. My name is uh, Renat. Russia, okay, former, yeah, yeah. former yeah. Soviet. So, okay, Ukraine Jordan. might be part of Russia. So I know. Uh, I have not. a question for you. Um, what is your main uh, personal goal in all your life? Wow. For right now, my main goal, my, you know, goals to me are all relatively short term. Every you know, goal, by definition to me, has a date on it. It's got a start date and an end date, which is very different than my vision for the future, which is more of a longer term thing. I don't take any emotional connection in my goals. I don't set goals and, and then say, if I achieve it, then I'll feel good, because it's a very difficult way to live, because you might feel good for a second when you achieve it, and 
all the way up there, you're miserable, and Maybe then after, dream. like, what do Maybe I do dream. next, right? So it's not, a, it's not really a, a good way to live, but in terms of one goal I have right now is I am working on what I believe is the biggest project I've had in a long time, besides the Netflix series, is, is my launch into the metaverse. And I'm really working with some very smart people um, on my own NFTs, um, and my own launch into this new, exciting universe, which I believe is gonna be the dominant way by which we communicate and transact business, especially progressing over the next 10 years. Thank you so Thank much. You. Scram, there was another question over here. Right there? Okay, what is your name? Where are you from? What's your question? Hi. Pull your mask down. Pull your mask down. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hi, Jordan. Big fan of your audacity. And thank you so much for moderating the event uh, so absolutely uh, beautifully. I am Riva and uh, of known as Crypto Dragonis on um, Web3, I guess. And I'm from Singapore. have been living in the UAE for more than 10 years now. Um, when I look at blockchain, I really am thinking about the kind of impact uh, the blockchain in terms of NFTs or cryptocurrency could be making across communities. When you look at uh, the global population and the number of people who own at least one NFT, the top ranking country is the Philippines. 38% of uh, people from the Philippines own at least one NFT. Second on the list is actually Thailand. We've got about 22%. Um, oh, God. <laughs> and uh, third on the list is UAE, 11%. Now, when you look at the US, which is below 5% of people own at least one NFTs, I see a global wealth shift over here, going to countries where a lot of communities are actually utilizing the aspect of what NFTs could bring or, or cryptocurrency or blockchain could bring for their communities. Now, my question to you is this. I am one of the founders of Brava NFT. Uh, and a percentage of all our proceeds actually go to charity. Uh, we are fighting gender-based violence. How does Jordan Belfort see um, charity and blockchain working together? Do you have any plans to bring something like a project like Brava NFT to, uh, to the world? So um, I am actually have uh, an NFT that's being auctioned off on Super Rare. Um, in the beginning of the year. It's a one of one. It's a, a very famous picture that I did with a, a photographer named David Yarrow. And it sold a couple of years ago. The physical picture sold for $200,000. Um, the, est the estimates on the reserve for this sale are north of $1 million, just for this one piece. Wow. Now, 100% of those proceeds are going to charity. Of this, of this initial sale we're doing on Super Rare, 100%. Thanks. And both David and I are very passionate about that. Some of the charities that that money is being split among are some NFT-related charities of empowering people to be, become educated about NFTs um, and so forth. And some stuff is going to animals because David photographs animals. So we're spreading that money around. But everything I've always done in my life, I've always had a charitable component to it. Um, and like, and I always find that when I do that, um, I always have more fun when I have something I'm doing for charity. It just sort of it revitalizes me, invigorates me, so I think it's a great thing. Uh, in terms of one specific charity, you know, today, you know, I'm looking very much in terms of South America. My wife's family is, is, is from South America, and there is so much terrible stuff going on down there. Um, and there are you know, men, women especially, but so I, I think this is really a chance. I really, what I said before, is one of the mistakes that we make often, being from a first world country, is we forget that most of the world does not have access to the same type of banking um, instruments that we do. They just don't have a steady supply of credit, a, a stable currency, a safe place to put their money. Um, so I think all the things you said are true, and I plan on being a part of it. That is so amazing. And Brava NFT is also giving to charity in one of the South American countries as well. Uh, Mexico and Fondo Semillas is one of the charities that we are supporting. And um, just no, that's uh, all we have time for. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. I, we're actually out of no. We're briefly. out of time. We're out of. We're literally out of time. And all I right. appreciate thank that. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, real, real quick question. Dwarf tossing. Was it true? <laughs> well. Um, yes or no. I never tossed a dwarf okay, myself. Okay, that's all I needed to know. There you go. Let's give it up for Jordan and him spending time with us today. Big hand for Jordan.